Hello, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're listening. And welcome to the Third Bridge Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Segvich, recording from our London office. In each episode of our podcast, we hope to explore the minds of some of the world's most innovative founders. But trust me, this isn't going to be a podcast where we provide tips from successful entrepreneurs. Honestly, there are lots of great podcasts that do that. But what we're doing is taking a unique approach to these conversations. As a company, Third Bridge believes that those human insights, that's the knowledge that's based on your own experiences or those learned from others, are the most powerful tool to gaining an investment advantage. Frankly, it's why our investor clients choose us when they're looking to generate better returns. What we've also seen beyond our own business is that founders of businesses all over the world can trace their own business success to human insights. Whether it's the lessons learned from their own experiences or the information shared by an inspiring mentor or those dozens of no's that they hear from investors before finally getting to that critical yes. And that's the information we frankly find to be the most interesting and engaging as well. It makes for great storytelling. So we thought, why not have a podcast where we can dig into those and have conversations with these really innovative founders about those human insights and how they drove success for their own businesses. So actually, we hope you have as much fun listening to these conversations as we enjoyed having them. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, we're going to be sitting down in a moment with Tobias Peggs from Square Roots. Um, this is a really interesting business co-founded by Kimball Musk that basically changes the way, essentially, that we think about where our food comes from. Uh, most of us are used to going into the store and you know buying bananas or herbs or you know vegetables that could have come from thousands of miles away. And Tobias and Kimball really wanted to change that and localize where we get our food from. So they've created a business that revolutionizes how we do that. And there's a couple things that I wanted to point out prior to uh, jumping into the conversation with Tobias. And one is, um, I think it's really interesting how he came to the idea to found this business, spending time in a retail environment that most of us will have heard of and getting a sense of how these sort of mass market produce is coming into households uh, across the world and how he really wanted to affect change in that with the business that he launched with Kimball. So I think that's really interesting. Please listen to that. Um, the other thing that I think is completely fascinating about this business is it's not only a uh, a typical business in the sense that they want to succeed and, and grow their customer base and um, have their employees do well, but it's also an incubator for talent. So they are taking individuals and putting them in an environment um, where they become micro entrepreneurs within the company. Um, and then when they get to sort of the end of their um, cycle with the business, they're prepped to become the next great food entrepreneurs who will create businesses that will revolutionize you know, how we consume food. So really interesting business, uh, both from in terms of you know, how we uh, consume uh, what they produce, but also in terms of the successful talent that they're producing as a business when their employees go through the program of, of being farmers. So really excited to, uh, to bring you this conversation and um, take a listen. Tobias, thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here and uh, excited to try and explain what we're doing. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think the concept, like I said, I think it's really going to resonate with our listeners. It, it resonated with me when you and I were chatting before the uh, the recording. Um, and, and I think, you know, you've got obviously a very interesting business um, that impacts consumers on a daily basis. So really excited to have you have an opportunity to talk about how you came about the idea and how you've gotten to the point you are now. But before we get into that, um, why don't we um, kick off by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, where are you from, um, where are you now, and then kind of how did you get to where you are now? Yeah, so, um, you know, I grew up in England in uh, rural Devon and Cornwall, which is lovely. Um, you know, ended up doing um, computer science at school. And uh, this would have been sort of as the consumer internet was happening, mid-90s. So pretty much I've spent most of my career on the internet. Um, you know, I always joke that I went to school or university without an email address because they didn't really exist for normal people. And uh, when I left, I set up a web company, right? It was kind of like right at that moment. Um, <laughs> during, that. Yeah, during that sort of time, I ended up in Silicon Valley 
um, sort of been early 2000s, I guess. Um, and uh, there I met uh, this chap called Kimball Musk, um, who had already been a very successful internet entrepreneur. Him and his brother had you know, built and sold companies for hundreds of millions of dollars. And um, he was actually setting up an early social media analytics company. Um, and uh, so I started working with him on that. It would have been sort of 2005, I guess. Um, <clears throat> I ended up becoming CEO of that company. Um, and uh, that company was acquired by Walmart, of mm. people. So uh, you know, I went from startup land to working at Walmart, which is very interesting, right? You go from a company with like 20 employees to one with 2 million employees and you, you learn a lot about how to execute at a completely different scale. Yeah. Um, Kimball at that point had already um, sort of got very, very interested in the food system in the US and completely different from tech. You know, he was beginning to see very big issues with the industrial food system. Uh, you know, 30% of greenhouse gases come from industrial agriculture. The food that we eat is often shipped in from the other side of the world. We've got you know, no idea who grows it or, you know, how it's grown. Um, you know, the food that we're eating is making us fat and sick, you know, obesity, Di, um, you know, diabetes epidemics, you know, all are linked back to the food system. So he started beginning to look at this and, and, and you know, was getting very curious. While I was working in Walmart, pure coincidence, one of the projects that I did, I started looking at global grocery buying behaviors and, mm. and was seeing issues with the food system, um, you know, in, in other ways, right? I was looking at hundreds of millions of Walmart customers around the world buying uh, food products, you know, and clearly wanting to have products from all over the world. You know, people in the UK buying bananas, you know, perfectly reasonable. But, but, and I started thinking, well, okay, when I was growing up in the UK, like we weren't growing bananas in the UK. It's like, where, where is that food coming from? Yeah. And, and sort of, you know, I then began to see food just being shipped in, you know, from the other side of the world. And, um, you know, began to understand the problems with that, right? Not only the, the, the impact on the planet with all that sort of shipping, but also the impact in terms of the end quality of the food, right? As food travels, sure. basically the nutrients are just breaking down into sugars. And, you know, on the one hand, it means the food that we eat mostly from supermarkets is kind of tasteless. Um, you know, but there's a reason for that, right? Which is it, it might be high in calories, but it's like very low in nutrients. And there's a sort of direct correlation between taste and nutrient. Anyway, so I started seeing all those issues. And then and Kimball and I, you know, from our different different aspects, came back together again a couple of, maybe three or four years ago now, and uh, started working on uh, the business that, that we now have together, which is Square Roots. Right. Now, that's, that's interesting. What I love about that story is um, and this is you know a, a, kind of a theme that we we really want to um, get to on on our podcast where we're talking to you know founders of really interesting companies is you know our theory is that um, in the life cycle of a company there are moments either at the front end at launch or during the existence of the company where they uncover an insight that's formed from their own opinions or experiences or observations or someone else that's, you know, connected to that idea. And this whole concept that you, you know, you could have looked at any number of data sets and seen the, you know, the miles traveled to deliver food and things like that. And you probably did. Uh, but having that experience at Walmart, you know, where you witnessed it firsthand, um, I think, you know, I find that and I think our listeners will find it really interesting that that was what you know, really kind of crystallized it for you and, and made it real and you kind of understood the the pain points and the opportunity. So um, so I love that. That's such a such a unique, um, great story. Um, well, it's, yeah, j just to interrupt there, it's funny actually. We, we, so we call that our aha moment. Sure. Um, and, and actually at Square Roots, we use that during interview questions, right? Because, you know, we're a very sort of mission-driven company, right? We're trying to change the, the food system here to one that's better for people, planet, as well as profits. And, and we need to make sure that folks are mission aligned. And often, 
know, that comes from this aha moment, right, where they saw something or felt something or maybe there was a family experience or just something that made them stop and think, holy cow, the way that this planet currently produces food is like putting, you know, everybody at crisis point and, and we got to change, right? So we always look for that um, in new employees. Yeah. No, I mean, it's such a critical um, sort of, you know, I guess, discovery. And I love that, you know, that, like you said, the aha moment. Um, uh, and I love that you got, you wrap that into just kind of the, the culture of your, of your company when it's, you know, either new hires or just kind of um, ideating in, internally about, you know, um, strategies and things like that. So tell, you know, I, I think we've just kind of scratched the surface, but, but tell our listeners a little bit about, um, you know, Square Root. So you obviously had discovered this pain point um, that you aimed to tackle, um, and there are lots of different ways you could have done that, but tell tell us a little bit about what what you did, and you know the partnership with Kimball, and how you sort of got to where you were able to start um, addressing this issue. Yeah, sure. So you know the issue is the current industrial food system is a disaster, and and you look at solutions for that, and you start to realize that locally grown food can be the solution here. Right? If, if food is grown in the same neighborhood as the end consumer, right, then the consumer can get more connected to that food. Right? They can literally know their farmer and, and see what's going on. Uh, the food doesn't have to travel very far. Right? It can go from farm to retail store or table within you know, 24 hours of harvest. That means the food is fresh. It's more nutritious. There's less waste along the way. That's another huge issue with industrial food today, right? 40% of the food that is grown in the U.S. is wasted. Um, and you can go on and on and on, but, you know, the bottom line is if we could get locally grown food to every single person on the planet, wouldn't that be a good thing? Mm. It, 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 and that's all well and good until you start to think about where these people live, right? So by 2050, we're heading for a world with 10 billion people, and 70% of them will live in urban areas. So if you want to think about getting locally grown food to people, then you've really got to figure out urban farming, right? How do you grow food in the city where people live? And, you know, once, once you start going down that path, you realize that, well, technology can, can help do that. Technology can also help do that all year round, right? And so specifically what you can do is build indoor farms, um, and inside those farms, you can recreate the perfect growing conditions for a variety of, of crops from around the world. And so, what that means then is that you know you can you know people want food from all over the world. Great, you can recreate climates from all over the world, but do that in the same zip code as that consumer, and then grow all of that food, but grow it locally. Um, and, and, you know, this is like the world of indoor controlled climate farming, as it's known. And, and so Kimball and I sort of jumped on there as, as a concept probably three years ago. And then, you know, what we've done in that meantime is, is built a very scalable and very smart uh, technology platform that enables us to grow this food all year round. Um, we've built... Um, a really great brand, actually, that, that the urban consumer very much resonates with, which is all about getting that consumer connected to their local farm um, and their farmer. And the farmer element is, is sort of the third leg of the stool at Square Roots. Um, so as we were sort of thinking about how to pull this business together, you know, we realized that we needed a lot of farmers in, in this system, right? If you're going to feed the world and you want every consumer to have a direct relationship with a local farmer, then you need a lot of farmers. Now, in the US, there's actually a big problem there. Um, the average age of a farmer in the United States is almost 60 years old at this point. Wow. There's this, you know, we all can articulate issues with the industrial food system, you know, pesticides and pollution and all this stuff. But one of the talking points that doesn't get as much air coverage is the demographic time bomb that's about to go off. Right, which is when these farmers retire, like who the hell is going to grow all the food? And, and when we started talking with younger people about this, you know, they were very, very excited about you know, new food systems and 
you know, wanting to, to sort of contribute to that movement, but they didn't want to go live, you know, on a massive farm in the middle of the country, right? They wanted to be in a city and surrounded by their friends and technology. And, you know, we realized that the, the platform that we were building here would be very, very attractive to these young people. Um, and so we went the extra mile and actually created a, a, a training program that we call the Next Gen Farm Training Program. And really this acts as an on-ramp for young people. Maybe they've got no experience growing food whatsoever, but we can surround them with technology and training and a team and take them from complete novices to be really good farmers in about six weeks inside our indoor farms. And then they work with us and they grow the food. Wow. And um, in addition to growing the food, we also provide these people with very structured training on entrepreneurship frameworks, on community building, on plant science. They get experience and exposure from seed to sales, right? They're not only growing the food, they're helping us with install demos and marketing the food. And the idea is at the end of their 12 months, once they graduate from Square Roots, they've now got incredible experience and a very rounded appreciation of what local food systems can be. And our idea is that they would then go off and set up their own companies, you know, that will also contribute to this mission, right? Yeah. And so we sort of think of Square Roots as not only growing food, but kind of growing the next generation of entrepreneurial leaders um, in this space as well. Um, so it's very much a sort of double bottom line business, you know, we think about the profits, we grow food, we sell food, yeah. and we think about the impact, right? We're unleashing this new generation of food entrepreneurs who are now much more likely to make a success of whatever idea they have because of the experiences that they've uh, gathered while they've been uh, with us. It's such a, such a cool concept. I love that. I mean, obviously, you've got this company that's growing and succeeding um, but the impact you're creating in people's lives and, and the fact you're, you know, I guess, you know, to use kind of a buzzword in the, in the tech community, you're, you know, you kind of got an incubator, right, for these uh, future leaders in the food community. That's, I mean, it's just terrific. It's really fascinating. Yeah, thanks. I think, um, you know, when we first started talking about this, this concept, you know, two or three years ago, certainly when we were talking with the investor community, one of the questions that they would constantly sort of ask us is, you know, well, who the hell wants to come and be a farmer for you? Like, where are you going to find these people? And, um, you know, to, to sort of test that, we, we put out a single blog post describing the concept, saying that we were going to try and hire, you know, 10 people to start in this role um, sort of in mid-2016. And, you know, we just wanted to see, okay, is anyone going to apply? Do they want to be a farmer? We had over a thousand applications wow. for the, okay. the first program. Uh, we didn't. We had nothing. We had, I don't even think the company had a website at that point in time, right? We certainly didn't have a farm that we could show people. It was literally, you know, a concept on a blog post, but it resonated, right? Mm. I, Kimball and I often talk about this. You know, twenty years ago when we started our careers, we wanted to go to Silicon Valley and build internet companies, and you know that was what you you wanted to do you talk to you know early 20 year olds today generation z i guess now right kind of post millennials and you know honestly they care more about where their food comes from than how they're going to pay their rent this month mm. right food is the internet for this generation right they want to become food entrepreneurs they want to make a difference to the world and uh, it's just so hard for them to get started, right? And I think that that's, you know, we now provide that on-ramp for these people. And as I said, we're getting thousands of applications every time we, you know, we, we sort of open a new farm. Yeah, no, I love that. Such a, it's such a, like I said, it's such a cool concept. And, and I love that you're just giving our listeners a, an insight into the motivations of, of these individuals and then and, and why the concept really, really works and really resonates. I, I'm curious, uh, do you have any fun anecdotes or stories about, um, you know, maybe a farmer or two that's that's gone through your, your program and, and, you know, now that they've, you know, like, as you put it, graduated from the program, have moved on or, or stayed with the company or I'm, yeah, just 
for our listeners. Yeah, I think that a, could be cool. It's amazing. Yeah, we, we sort of internally we we sort of call this our pathway, right? So the the pathway starts now with um, you know we run open house community tours, right, where anyone can come and have a look and see what's going on. We'll often then have people come up to us at the end of that tour saying, I'm so inspired by this. It's awesome. You know, I want to apply to be part of the program. You then see them come through, right? They get through the application process. They're a farmer for 12 months. And then the final part of the pathway is what happens next, right? Mm. And so we're, we're midway through our third program right now. So, you know, we've, we've got a bit of a data set here to point this. But, but essentially, sort of the graduates end up in three directions, right? One is... They actually start their own farm, um, which is so awesome, right? So they've yeah. got the bug and, um, you know, different formats. We've got one guy who started a mushroom farm in his garage in Long Island and is now selling, like, mushrooms to all the top restaurants all over New York City. Um, there's a woman who started a rooftop farm and she works with local real estate developers and sort of builds a farm literally on the rooftop for apartment blocks and then runs a CSA program for all of the tenants in that building. Um, so, you know, very interesting creative ideas. And, you know, this is what we wanted, right? These entrepreneurial leaders there. The, the, the second group uh, completely fall in love with high-tech indoor urban farming, you know, which is what we do. And there are a number of uh, companies now around the world that are beginning to tackle this uh, um, uh, technology, sort of, you know, different form factors or what have you, and you know, our graduates will very easily find really incredible jobs um, at these companies. So we sort of act as a bit of a feeder for the rest of the industry. And then the the third pathway is folks join our team, right? Obviously, we're you know we're expanding like crazy, and so we need people who you know a completely buy into the mission. B, understand the values, C, understand our systems, um, right? And so farmers who've been through the 12-month program clearly have got all of that. And what we often find is during the 12 months, um, you know, people begin to start to specialize or they get interested in different things, right? So if I look out of my little office window here, I can see Max over there who was a farmer in our very first season who had a background in mechanical engineering, and basically spent his entire 12 months not just growing food, but also complaining about how terrible our technology was. <laughs> and so at the end of his year, I was like, mate, why don't you join our R&D team and help us build a better version of the farm? Wow. And so now he's you know, part of that R&D team coming up with you know, new designs and uh, you know, better ways to grow the food for fewer resources. And you know, it is like becoming a, a sort of superstar in, in the industry mm. in terms of indoor farm design. Yeah, that is such a that's such an interesting. I, I love that that you've got those sort of the three paths, and and you've got really great stories on all of those legs. It's a it's a it's a I think really useful for our listeners. I, I love it just here. I could listen to you kind of talk about the the uh, successes all day, and I'm sure they could as well. Um, but I want to hear a little bit more. Um, so you know, we've kind of talked to high level. You know what the the problems you're you're tackling in the sort of the food ecosystem. Um, how you're addressing those pain points for consumers, and then also just with your, you know, um, you know, with your with your farmer program, you know, the, what you're doing on that level. I want to hear a little bit more, just kind of tactically, just how does your concept work? I know you've got the the pilot farm in Brooklyn, and you've had a recent exciting announcement that we'll talk a little bit about um, in a few minutes as well. Um, but you know, I mean, give, give take me inside one of these, you know, sort of indoor farms, and then you know, what does it look like from you know, like you said, seed to sale? Give me a little bit of sure. that flavor. Yeah, so the farms are built inside refurbished shipping containers, and um, you know they literally sit on a disused or underutilized parking lot in the middle of Brooklyn. Right, so we had a conversation with the landlord and said, "Hey, we want to rent ten parking spaces, but instead of putting ten cars there, we want to put ten farms there." And here we are. <laughs> we we have a farm yeah. with ten of these containers. And, and inside each container is a controlled climate, right? So we can control the light, the temperature, the humidity, the CO2 level, the nutrients, the amount of water. And basically what we do is recreate the perfect environment to grow certain crops, 
right? So let's say we want to grow uh, basil or basil. Um, you know, we'll look um, around the world for the best basil that happens to come from the north of Italy, and then we'll study the weather pattern and the climate in the north of Italy, right? When does the sun come up? When does the sun go down? What is the temperature? What is the humidity? And we'll basically recreate that environment inside one of these boxes and then grow that same tasting delicious basil, right? So we've got 10 of these boxes, 10 different climates. We can grow, you know, a variety of different crops in those, in those climates. We focus right now a lot on herbs. So we do basil, mint, chive, sage, oregano, thyme, um, but we can also grow leafy greens, you know, kale, spinach, arugula, or, or rocket, I guess, in the UK. Um, and even uh, fruiting crops, right? Strawberries, tomatoes. Um, so there's a bu- bunch of stuff that we can grow from these farms. Um, so what, what happens is that the next gen farmers, right, the, the folks on the training program, they're the ones that are responsible for growing the food. Um, so they walk into the farm. Obviously, they're surrounded by software that we've built um, that is essentially guiding them through the workflow. Right. So they'll walk into a farm, open the app. The app knows that you know they're in farm number seven. That's full of basil. It's a Wednesday. It's ready to be harvested, and you know we'll basically give them the instructions for the day. Um, so they might spend the day harvesting and packing into little clamshells, Um, then we distribute to about 70 different retailers across New York and Brooklyn. Um, We distribute that ourselves. We have a little uh, fleet of e-trikes with climate controlled boxes on the front. Um, So basically the the food comes out from the farming container into the the little box on the front of this e-trike and we literally cycle around New York and distribute the food to all these retailers. And then what's also interesting is that on every uh, retail package, there's a QR code. And when a customer or a consumer scans that QR code on their mobile phone, they get to see what we call a transparency timeline, a complete step-by-step guide of how that food got to that retail store. You know, when was it seeded? Who seeded it? Um, When was it harvested? Who harvested it? Pictures along the way. Um, right, so everybody knows how their food was grown, who grew that food. They can double tap on the farmers' faces and go oh. check out their Instagram profile and learn more about the farmers. So it's cool. all about being completely transparent um, uh, with, with the food, um, and uh, you know that's pretty much how we go from seed to sales. Wow. Yeah. No. I mean, that really paints the picture, and I love that. Um, I, I, <laughs> I want to. I want to like have one of your. Um, one of your, you know, one of your, you know, uh, sachets of, of basil or whatever, and, and actually test that out myself and, and follow that journey of the, of the food. I love that, you know, you're allowing the consumer a window into, into their food as opposed to just this, you know, kind of invisible journey that I think most people are used to, right? Like you said, going back to when you were a kid, you know. I mean, completely right, right? If you, you know, any survey of food consumers where you ask them what do they want, it's not, you know, different flavors or, you know, different this. It, it's more transparency. That is the number one request from food shoppers, right? They want to know where their food comes from. And so, you know, we took this idea of transparency to the nth degree, right? Not just with the transparency timeline on the packaging so you can see that story, but like physically, right? Our farms have got a huge window on the end that we leave open all day long. So anybody walking by can just, you know, literally see the farmer at work, mm. um, you know, and see how their food is grown. So yeah, transparency to us, you know, is is much more than a sort of marketing term. It's, you know, we got the data to back it up and then we live it as a core value. Um, you know, and you kind of see that permeate everything we do from, um, you know, phys- uh, physical infrastructure, you know, to everything else. I want to talk a little bit about um, your recent announcement. Um, so, you know, obviously, I think you know you've you've really painted the picture of of you know how you guys started and this this you know the um, you know Brooklyn and how the food is delivered and and whatnot. But 
you obviously wanted to, and I think you know this was key when you and, and Kimball were discussing the idea. Is how does this how does this scale, right? And so this recent announcement, this partnership. Um, why don't you tell our list, little, listeners a little bit about it and what it means for kind of the next um, phase for Square Roots? Yeah. So your you know your point on um, you know how does this scale, right, Kimball? always ask those questions like how does this scale how does this feed the world how can we you know get this to 10 billion people as fast as possible and um you know everything i've described about c to sales thus far is what we do in brooklyn and, and so the sort of you know question that we asked ourselves at the end of last year was okay great how do we take this to every american city and then every international city um and we started looking for partners who could help with that. So the, the big announcement that we made um, in March of this year is a strategic uh, partnership that we formed with a company called Gordon Food Service. Uh, they are a multi-billion dollar food distribution company, food services company. Uh, so what that means is, that, you know, they provide the food to every restaurant, every uh, you know, hotel, kitchen, hospital, kitchen, every school kitchen. Um, you know, if you're a chef in a, in a restaurant, you know, you're not popping down the road to Whole Foods to buy your food, right? You know, a big truck comes along with, you know, all the food you need for the week. And, um, uh, you know, Golden Food Service, GFS, are, are like a very premium company in that space. Also, a very wonderful company, family-owned, over a hundred. 20 years old, I think, at this point, um, you know, it's led by sort of, you know, six or seventh generation family, you know, very, like, just incredible kind of Midwest values, great people to work with. Anyway, they also have huge scale, right? So they have over 200 um, distribution centers and retail stores across North America. And we're basically now working with them to put Square Roots Farms on every single one. Um, the idea then is that they can now offer their customers locally grown food and do that all year round. Um, we can help them get their customers, their chefs, um, and more you know connected with that local farmer. Um, and um, you know, in addition, of course, that turns our farmer training program into you know what we hope will become a global movement. Right? We'll have much, much, much more capacity now to hopefully be training, you know, not just tens of people at a time, but thousands of, of people at a time. And so we're not just unleashing, you know, one or two entrepreneurs out there into the world, but we're releasing, you know, hundreds of entrepreneurs out there to the world. So, yeah, very, very exciting relationship and a lot of work to do now, um, you know, to make it happen. But the, the, the pathway is there. And, you know, the idea, as I said, is to you know, go bring locally grown food to, you know, pretty much every consumer in a, in a major metro area in, in the U.S. in the next couple of years. Wow. So it, what, um, what markets on the, on the sort of the short term, what markets might people expect to start to be able to, you know, um, to have some of your, your products? Yeah, so our first farm, actually, we announced this uh, two weeks ago. We're, we're going to open a farm together in Michigan um, this autumn or this fall. Um, so that'll be the first one. And then um, there's a whole roadmap behind that. So uh, watch this space, I would say. But Michigan will be the first one that opens um, sort of in the September time frame. Okay. And speaking of, I mean, when you when you brought up that, uh, that timeline – I imagine because you're able to, um, you know, kind of create these contained environments where you're, uh, you know, mimicking um, the, you know, growing um, environments of, you know, pretty much anywhere in the world. Does that pr kind of remove the seasonality of it um, and where you can grow things year round and, um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> in, in short, in short, yes. The, okay. the sort of pithy one line that we have is that it's always in season indoors, right? You know, right. even if there's kind of two foot of snow outside, inside it's you know seventy five and sunny, right? Perfect conditions to grow basil. Um, it, it is quite interesting, though. 
you know, as we as we've been taking the product to market, um, you know, to us, we were like, wow, you can have, you know, the you know, literally the best basil in the world because we're recreating the climate from the best region and the best time in the world, and you can have that all year round. Like, isn't that amazing? It. it it's quite interesting, actually, how much the consumer is sort of programmed towards seasonality, right? Sage is a great example, right? We, we you know, launched a Sage line here in November, and that was a massive seller through the holiday season, and everyone loved it. Um, and as soon as the holiday season disappeared, um, you know, I guess, like, you know, recipes that people are reading in newspapers or magazines or whatever, you know, are not showing Sage, right? And so it, it was sort of interesting to watch that particular product um you know rather than like grow in sales kind of flatten out in sales so there's you know so so the, there's a lot of things we can do mm. grow this food all year round and then there's a lot of listening that we need to do um you know to make sure we're putting a product out that people you know really want to buy or that we're helping sort of folks understand you know, why we're able to do this, right? And why buying sage, for example, in April, you know, it's still locally grown, it's super fresh, it's super tasty, it might not be anything like any other product that they can buy out there, right? Because to get sage today, it needs to be shipped in from South America or something, right, where, where there's the season. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's sort of an interesting, uh, interesting balance, right, between capability and market demand. Yeah. No, it's very interesting. Yeah, I, so we've obviously talked a lot about the the positives and the you know the demand that that exists and um, you know things like that. But I'm sure you know you're also looking at you know at challenges and and uh, you just challenges in the market, um, to continue to you know to um, grow and 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 take the the business to the next level. Yeah, it's a good question. I think sort of every year we ran the business, the, the answer changes, right? So I would say our first year, 2016, the challenge was, can we take a young person with no experience and get them to grow really tasty food that people will enjoy eating, right? And when we first told people, you know, hey, we're going to take this kid with no experience and put them in a box in a parking lot in Brooklyn and the food's going to be amazing, you know, people thought we were insane. <laughs> so, you know, that was like challenge number one. And we proved that we could do that, right? So then challenge number two for the second year was, okay, can this become a business? All right? so we were able to train these folks to grow this amazing food. And then we took a very sort of, you know, tech, you know, move fast and break things, iterate fast, you know, whatever, whatever term you want to use. But, you know, we tried a number of different um, go-to-market models, uh, retail, restaurants, direct to consumer. We, you know, we had people harvesting food in the morning, jumping on a bike, and you know, delivering a uh, a fresh salad to your desk right wherever you worked, just in time for lunch. Um, you know, there's all sorts of crazy things that we tried, and we you know ultimately um, uh, kind of settled on the retail model. Mm -hmm. So it's like, great, yep, we can teach people how to grow food and we can make money here by selling, um, you know, this stuff to retail. And then the third challenge then was, okay, well, how does this scale, right? How do we do this, you know, in every city across the world? And, you know, the Golden Food Service deal is you know, helping us to answer that question, right? And so now the challenge is, you know, how do we keep this going, right? The, the sort of you know, evolutions of companies where in the early stages, you know, adrenaline, the excitement is, you know, keeping you going 24-7 to make the impossible happen, right? And as the company matures, um, you've got to make sure that you, you know, maintain that kind of startup hustle, um, you know, even in a world where kind of the pathway is, you know, is a little bit more sort of certain and it's more about execution, Right, but you don't want to, you know, slow down, right? Because, right. you know, I mean, A, other competitors might come in, but, you know, B, without sounding too grandiose about it, like the world needs this, you know, like the faster we can make it happen, the faster we can bring local food to people, the, the better. So that that's kind of, you know, the, the, the challenge today, right? Sure. We're sort of emerging from this, you know, startup chrysalis into a, into a butterfly and, 
and we've got to make sure we, you know, we're, we're, we're still moving fast as that butterfly. Right. How about, um, you know, long-term uh, plans you just touched on? Obviously, you're, you're really motivated to, you know, to, to um, expand the, you know, what you're doing. Um, and obviously, the Gordon Food Service um, Partnership gives you quite a foothold, um, you know, at least in the, at least in, in the U.S. And, and North America. International expansion, is that on the horizon? Is, the, um, yeah. is that something you're looking at down the road? Yeah, 100%. So we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, a global um, suite of investors with us, right? We have investors from Scandinavia, from South Africa, from the Middle East. Um, and so conversations, you know, naturally draw us to those regions. Mm-hmm. It, it, and each one of those is quite interesting, right? Scandinavia's got very, very short outdoor growing season. So indoor growing, where you can you know, have a 12-month season, makes perfect sense, right? Middle East, crazy water shortages, and you know, given it's like 40 degrees centigrade outside most of the year, it's kind of hard to grow food outdoors, right? So indoor farming, but it's also very water efficient, which our system is, makes a ton of sense there, right? So sort of wherever you look around the globe, you know, there might be different drivers, um, or different kind of reasons, but the, the answer is always indoor farming is going to work. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I don't see sort of international expansion happening in the next 12 months, but in the next, you know, 36 months, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of demand out there for sure. Okay. How about um, other types of, of, of produce? I mean, you mentioned right now you're, you know, primarily focused on, on herbs and leafy green vegetables. Um, any, you know, thoughts on kind of expanding your offering on that front? Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the question isn't really one about capability. It's more about economics, right? So without getting too lost in, in it, you know, photosynthesis, right, the plant growing, you know, what happens is the plant takes energy from a light source and turns that into biomass, right, grows, yep. grows it as a plant. And so our energy comes from indoor lighting, which gives us, you know, a lot of precision and a lot of control, but clearly is, you know, plugged into the grid and, and costs us in terms of an energy bill every month, right? So essentially, the, the, the heavier the vegetable, the more biomass it, 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 it's creating and therefore the more energy it needs to create that biomass right so things like herbs and leafy greens not too much biomass doesn't need that much energy you can get that product to market today at a very competitive price right if you're trying to grow something like a turnip right much more biomass requires much more energy and maybe today it's a little challenging to get that to market Um, i think the good news though is as technologists we can obviously use technology to bend those cost curves, right? You know, if I'm an outdoor farmer, I can't suddenly make the sun twice as efficient and half my cost, right? Whereas if I'm an indoor farmer, I can certainly work on the lighting system and make that twice as efficient and be able to have that cost, right? And, yeah. and so, um, you essentially, you can just draw a line. Of, of vegetables, you know, of increasing biomass, and essentially we're picking them off one by one, right? So herbs, yes, leafy greens, yes, small fruiting crops, strawberries, tomatoes, we're right on the cusp. Um, you know, and then we're sort of experimenting, growing a whole bunch of different things right now. We've got eggplants or aubergines growing in the farm right now. A couple of weeks ago, we had a chili eating competition in the office with some habaneros that one of the farmers had grown. That was amazing. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a whole, whole bunch of stuff that we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Very fun time on the farm. Great. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I think our listeners have as well. Like I said at the top of the call, um, it's, it's an area that I think resonates with just about everybody. So, um, I really, you know, thank you for kind of helping us take a deep dive into what you're doing. Um, what we've done on our, on our podcast and what I, what I'd like to do now is we usually kind of wrap up with a bit of fun. Um, and, um, we've typically with our other guests played the traditional word association game and we call it word bridge. It's a play on, on our name, third bridge. Um, but what I'd like to do with you, cause I think it's interesting cause a, obviously, you're in the food industry, and B, you're a, um, a an Englishman living in the U.S. 
And I think you've touched on it throughout the throughout the uh, conversation today. Some of the differences in what what Brits and Americans um, call different types of food. So what I'm going to do is I will say the British and American version of a few different um, uh, fruit, f- food items, and you kind of tell me what's your preference. What do you, what do you say? Um, yeah. So basil or basil? Oh my god. I have to say basil, honestly, every time I hear myself saying basil, it's like nails on a chalkboard. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, if I say basil, no one's got a clue what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> yeah, I kind of hate myself every day. <laughs> All right. Tomato or tomato? Uh, tomato, tomato. Um, kind of depends how tired I am, actually. It, it is quite interesting you know, I notice when I'm tired, I do tend to slip into English English. And I'm sort of realizing that, you know, there's like, you know, point not 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 two percent of my brain power that's like constantly translating to American English. And that's the first one that goes when I'm tired, actually. Okay. So I'd say today, tomato, okay. maybe tomorrow, tomato. Got it. OK. Um, oregano or oregano? Oh, yeah. I actually say um, oregano. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel pretty comfortable with that. I don't know whether I cooked a lot with um, oregano when I was in the UK. In fact, I'm even sort of, you know, deliberately enunciating that now. So, you know, meaning I'm not familiar with it. So, yeah, oregano for sure. Okay. Uh, zucchini or courgette? <laughs> um, I always say courgette. Okay. For sure, yeah. All right. Eggplant or aubergine? Uh, you know what? I really don't like the taste. So if I never have to say either one of them, I'd be pretty happy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Well, I'm playing that one right down the middle anyway. Um, arugula or rocket? Uh, arugula. I didn't even know arugula was rocket, actually. Um, it yeah. was only when I posted something about square roots arugula on Facebook and then all of my English friends piled in and said, don't you mean rocket? You've been living abroad too long. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, um, arugula. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I mean, it's been really fascinating for me too because I'm living your, I'm living kind of your experience in reverse, right? I'm an American who's moved over to the UK, um, and so I, I've had the sort of the reverse experience that uh, you know I cringe having to say basil instead of basil, and you know it took me a while. I honestly I didn't even realize rocket was arugula uh, for a couple months after I moved here, but. Um, Exactly. Yeah, and it's... I'm sure you're sporting a very nice jumper. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful about, about telling anybody about their pants as well. So Especially khaki pants, which yeah. Americans are very fond of wearing, and British people really laugh when you say that. <laughs> Great. I love it. Uh, so uh, the other thing that we like to do is just to kind of take take people inside the lives of these interesting founders at the beginning of their day and, and ask, you know, what's the first thing that you do when you get to the office each day? Oh, um, when I get to the office, that kind of depends. Actually, my, my schedule starts much earlier than that. Um, so I'll get up, I'll have a cup of coffee. Uh, it's almost becoming a bit of a cliche now, but I meditate for 20 minutes. Um, just to like get my head in order, get focused, get rolling. Um, I'll then often exercise. I'm a competitive triathlete. Okay. Um, and then I get to the farm. Right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I might turn up here at like 9.30, but the day's kind of three hours old at that point. Sure. Okay. Um, great. Well, yeah, I, 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 I've, like I said, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Um, you know, hopefully it was... Uh, Enjoyable for you as well. Um, yeah, and I really enjoyed it. Thank it, you very much. Yeah, no, you've been you've been really um, interesting, and I think our listeners will really enjoy it. Um, I definitely want to make sure before I before I um, leave the conversation, um, where can our listeners go to find out a little bit more about Square Roots and what you guys are up to? Absolutely. So our website is squarerootsgrow.com, and then all of our social, Twitter, Instagram, is also at Square Roots Grow. Uh, we're super active on social, so definitely follow us. If you follow us on Insta, you'll get a really good view of like uh, you know what's happening day to day on the farm, uh, pictures from inside the farms, what the farmers are doing. Um, it's really fun, actually. Great. Well, thanks again, Tobias, Um, and I will, it's going to hurt me to say this, but I know you're a Tottenham supporter, so I will wish you good luck against Manchester City later. Uh, Come on, you spirit. (laughs) 
All right, well, uh, thanks again. Really enjoyed it, Tobias. Thanks, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Uh, cheers, bye. Cheers, bye.